Hi, this is Rose Pastore from Popular Science, and I'm talking with Fabian Cousteau, the oldest grandson of ocean explorer and filmmaker Jacques Cousteau. Fabian, why don't you tell us where you are right now? The oldest? Am I that old? The, the first grandson. <laughs> I, I am the eldest. Uh, I am privileged to be here. Thank you, Rose, for that uh, intro. This is the world's only undersea marine laboratory. It's called Aquarius. It's at 63 feet down at the bottom of the ocean, nine miles offshore of the Florida Keys. And we are starting, we're now actually in the fifth day of Mission 31, which is a mission that I'm leading that aims to stay down here at Aquarius for a full 30 days or full lunar cycle very much uh, in honor of what my grandfather's achievements were with Con Shell 2, as well as uh, many of the other aquanauts since then. As a matter of fact, I think you may even have Con Shell 2 in one of your early popular science magazines uh, up on the shelf, in the, uh, in the history shelves, if you will. I think we do. And that was uh, 50 years ago now? That's correct. This it was week, about 50 or? years ago. And uh, so we're, we're not only... Uh, honoring that legacy, but also uh, the very real need, oh, I just saw a diver right next to me, the very real need for ocean exploration into the future. We've explored less than 5% of our oceans to date. So Mission 31 really bolsters through communications, education, and science the importance and, of course, the thrill of ocean exploration. Are you studying something in particular while you're down there now? Of course. So. Uh, in terms of technology, we're using uh, some bands given to us by the Clinton Sleep Center that will monitor our circadian rhythms uh, because by and large, even though it looks bright out there, uh, much of the uh, solar spectrum or light spectrum has been filtered out by the time you get down to the level of the place. So that affects our sleep patterns and we want to make sure that we study those physiological effects. Beyond this, as you can tell, I may be breathing a little bit more heavily. I may sound a little strange. So there's a, a density as well in the air that's equivalent to pressure depth. In other words, for you, you're breathing one atmosphere of pressure in the air. For us, we're breathing basically three atmospheres of pressure. So it, it does make us sound different uh, and, of course, acts on our bodies in a different way. Uh, additionally, for science, when we go outside the habitat, and this is the whole reason for being down here, is that uh, living at saturation depth allows us to go on ocean walks for 6, 8, 10, 12 hours or more at a time, which you just can't do, pragmatically speaking, from the surface. So it allows for us, as scientists, researchers, and explorers, to go out much longer, deeper, and further. What we're doing specifically with science is we're looking at uh, climate change-related issues, as well as pollution. And thirdly, which is what's happening right now next door, and that's why I keep looking that way in our dry lab, is we're looking at predator prey fear behavior. What happens to prey when predators are around and how long and how uh, risky or how much risk taking would they take to feed themselves? Great. So so in a few minutes, Fabian, you're going to take us on a quick tour of the lab. But first, we had a bunch of questions from readers um, and a few questions from other editors in Popular Science. Um, the first question I wanted to ask comes from Melissa Phoenix on Facebook. And Melissa wanted to know what you're eating down there and whether you can actually cook food um, or if you've just had to bring all of the food along with you. Oh, well, that's a great question, Melissa, and uh, we actually eat very similar things to what astronauts eat. This is, after all, the only in, uh, international inner space station. So, like the ISS in space, this inner space station is equipped with similar features and uh, are, is also restricted with similar diets the way astronauts are. As a matter of fact, astronauts train here once a year to train to go in outer space. So we're eating basically, and I'll show you, I can reach up and grab something random here. I can show you what we're eating. We're eating freeze-dried foods, so pre-prepared foods that are freeze-dried. In this particular case, I won the jackpot. I won a blueberry cheesecake. But essentially, 
this is the kind of food that we uh, are relegated to because we're not allowed to have open flames in something enclosed like this. Because of the three atmospheres of pressure, you're also instigating uh, or exacerbating potential problems when you have open flames. Uh, so we're relegated to cooking with hot water and the microwave, and that's about it. I see. And so sort of a related question comes from one of our editors, Sophie Bushwick. She wants to know, she said you may have heard about using 3D printers to print food for astronauts in space. And so, uh, yes. so she wants to know if you would rather have a 3D printed pizza, freeze dried rations, or canned food. <laughs> uh, geez, none of those. I, I'm, I'm a French person, so as such, none of those options really sounds all that tasty. Um, I think I'm like any human being. The idea of printed food certainly doesn't sound all that appetizing. Uh, although I'm sure it's pragmatic. Um, I'm not sure how a 3D printer would react down here because as opposed to astronauts which are not subject to gravity, we still have all of the gravity of land-based dwellers down here, except we have the pressure differential which is very different. Um, so, so another question from Facebook from Teresa Chen. She wants to know um, how the air conditioning works there and how you are getting electricity. That's a very good question. As a matter of fact, a lot of people don't think about this, but even though we are in the water and people tend to get cold in the water if they stay there for a long period of time, we need an air conditioner for two reasons. One, to keep things cool inside because there's still uh, six warm bodies most times in here and it's a small enclosed environment and it's very, very humid because for obvious reasons we're exposed to the ocean. So we need a chiller or an air conditioner to keep things at a manageable temperature and humidity. Yesterday, we saw what that was like without the, uh, the chiller or the air conditioner. When it went out temporarily, it got very hot and humid. It reminded me of my expedition in the Amazon when we were visiting with the indigenous people. It got uh, quite literally uh, uh, so hot that we had to take our shirts off and everything else. Uh, so it's indispensable to have an air conditioner in an underwater habitat. Uh, how do we get power, which is actually the second question, is that we have a buoy at the surface that's tethered to us that gives us, in general, basic life support and, uh, and power down here at the habitat. That said, if we're cut off from the buoy, we still have a minimum of three days of power and air down below here at the habitat on either side of the habitat. I see. Um, so, one, another one of our editors had this question that you touched on a little bit earlier. So, why? Wh what are you hoping to learn by staying for 31 days that you couldn't learn just through a single descent diving down? Oh, that's a fantastic question. And actually, uh, I can summarize this by uh, repeating what a couple of our scientists who are here, and that's why I keep looking that way, because our dry lab is here. Uh, that's one of our uh, Navy guys who's going down to make sure everything's okay. Uh, the, by living on the final frontier, by living on the frontier of an environment that's been vastly underexplored, uh, we get a chance to do... Uh, a year's worth of science and data collecting uh, within the month that we're down here. Uh, if you're doing it from the, from the surface, it would take a whole year to do the same amount of data collection. As a matter of fact, we partnered with uh, students at FIU, Florida International University, as well as Northeastern University at MIT, in order to be able to collect data for those various topics that we're working on, including, of course, as I mentioned, climate change, certification, uh, predator-prey behavior, and such. And um, without it, we wouldn't be able to study the things that we need to study. So you also mentioned earlier about you're wearing yes. sleep trackers. Um, a lot yes. of our readers asked about sleep and whether that was difficult, uh, difficult to get to sleep, to sleep comfortably. Well, uh, I'll show you in the tour uh, how uh, comfortable or not you can uh, you can judge for yourselves. 
but um, in terms of sleep rhythms, uh, by and large, they're dictated by a number of factors, including, and very importantly, uh, the amount of light that one gets during the day and night. And with us, most of that light spectrum is filtered by the time it gets down to us. More importantly, we do get some variance between night and day, but it's not it's enough of a, or, or we lost enough of that that it may be a potential factor, and hence why we're using these sleep bands from uh, the Clinton Sleep Center to be able to monitor what happens to us. Now, another factor is that we start our morning at 4 o'clock in the morning so that we can get ready for a 6 a.m. dive. And then we dive three hours in the morning at minimum, three hours in the middle of the day, and at least three hours at night. So the rhythm with which we work uh, also has a factor to do with it. Basically, we're exhausted by the time we go to sleep at 11 o'clock at night. So, so far, after five days, we haven't had a problem sleeping. But uh, if anything, we've had a problem not sleeping enough. Uh, let's see. So here's... A question again from Facebook. Stan Landis wants to know if you think the ocean will ever be permanently colonized, and why hasn't this happened already? Well, I would venture to say that technologically speaking, it is absolutely possible to colonize the bottom of the sea. But financially speaking, uh, there's still a challenge. Oceans, by and large, whether it be for exploration, for science, or anything else, have been largely ignored, and if anything, have become the stepchild of those things. We've uh, gone away from ocean exploration, uh, and I'm not quite sure why, because at the end of the day, the oceans are our life support system, and they connect each and every one of us on this planet. Imagine a planet without oceans, or without that kind of biodiversity. We wouldn't be able to survive very long, if at all. So, um, to be a, maybe a little less esoteric about it, it also dictates our economy, uh, our well-being, our health, and we just don't know much about it. So, uh, it definitely behooves us to refocus our attention on our oceans, whether it be for science, for economics, or for the pure thrill of adventure. Great. So, the, I think the last question I'll ask before we go on the tour um, is from our editor, Jenny Bogo. Uh, she, wants, she wants to know, uh, if, we have, if you're imagining an undersea lab of the future, uh, what, what, sort of, what sort of technology should be in, in a futuristic undersea lab? Well, and that's a very good question, too. Matter of fact, that's been a constant discussion since Mission 31 came uh, in terms of uh, a project idea. Uh, you know, we started with my grandfather and others who have done uh, habitats in the 50s, uh, I'm sorry, the 60s, 70s, and a little bit in the 80s. And now we're looking at the world's last or only ever seen marine laboratory. And to me, uh, I feel like this is now the dawn of uh, marine exploration as it pertains to underwater living habitats. And I apologize for the diver's legs. I'm assuming he's probably just scrubbing the side there. But uh, that's what it takes to run an undersea laboratory. And how, there you're just... Yes. How many divers do you have out at any given time? Well, we have two or three divers at a time that come down normally just to make sure that the habitat is clean the valves are clean outside and such. We can do it ourselves as well, but because there are so many uh, marine operations from the six people that are inside between the science and the diving, uh, we need that extra help to make sure that everything's running properly. As a matter of fact, from the six people that are inside the habitat, we have about 18 or more people uh, back on land that are making sure for recognition control that everything is running, uh, is running fine. So, you know, back to, to undersea habitats and villages and cities, absolutely, we can have um, an Aquarius 2 or a Conch Shell 4 or maybe even a, uh, another type of, uh, of city under the sea. It's just a matter of wanting that to happen. 
So do you have, um, you know, when you think about the technology you have for research now and the technology for diving, um, is, there, is there some sort of uh, dream, dream tools, um, dream technology that it's not possible yet but would make your, your job a lot easier and make, make the science, uh, improve the science? Of course, I think rowing gills would be the first on my list. <laughs> but beyond that, um, there are people working on things like this. And scuba diving is fantastic. It's a great tool. It's been around since my grandfather invented it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it unfortunately has its limitations. And you have to carry your air supply with you everywhere, and it doesn't last very long. So if we can get around that, that potential problematic issue, um, be it a better, more efficient, and safer rebreather technology, or finding a way to make a uh, breathing system that works off of scrubbing the oxygen out of the water column uh, so that you can breathe it, then we really have something. Uh, there are a lot of people experimenting with different ways to try this, and so far I haven't seen anything quite pragmatic yet. But you may see eventually uh, someone with surgically implanted gills, you never know. Uh, in any event, I do believe that ocean exploration is at its next dawn and we do have a lot left to discover. And actually I do have one last question from our editor, Lindsay Cradwell. She, she wants to know how you deal with the constant humidity and if you have to wear special clothing or take any special measures uh, to deal with that. Well, humidity is a factor down here, although it's nice and comfortable today. We are in the water quite a bit, so any kinds of cuts or abrasions can go rampant very quickly, so we always have to keep track of that. And we also have to make sure that our ears are clean, that they're dry, and that we put drops in every night that we go out and dive, because otherwise you may have mushrooms growing out of your ears <laughs> sooner than you know it. But all those things are part of the course as far as learning how to live and work underwater for a full month or maybe even longer down the road.